thousands cheer with Moss Hart in 1933, and we needed a nostalgic song. I thought of this old tune, got it out, dressed it up with new lyrics, and it became the Easter Parade. The melody the critics thought was a dog in 1917 became a bestseller in 33, which proved to me that unless the lyrics match the tune, you haven't got a marriage. The Thai powers expect an addition to their family, and they hope to be home from London by the middle of June. Broad Crawford and his wife have reconciled, as I predicted they would. The hottest thing in Hollywood is a brand new singing team. Two boys who, believe it or not, are making their first professional appearance right at the very top at our world-famous Macombo. And to say that they've made the biggest hit of the year is an understatement. You know, I was there opening night. Their names, Charles Durand and Guy Brion, two fellows from Honolulu, one American-Hawaiian and the other American-Japanese Hawaiian. It won't be long before their voices will be known all over the nation. So I got them to sing tonight their very first time on the air. <laughs> Remember their names, Charles Durand and Guy Brion. And after they leave the Macambo, the Desert Inn at Las Vegas, then San Francisco. Background shots for Danny Kaye's picture on the Riviera were shot on the Riviera by a Hollywood camera crew. But they got some bathing beauties in those postage stamp suits which didn't pass the Breen office. So those scenes were reshot in California. And incidentally, Danny will be on this show next week. Everett Crosby called his brother Bing from New York with an offer, the largest sum ever offered anyone for one television show. And you know what Bing said? Try me again in 1955. <laughs> Kirk Douglas leaves for Palm Beach with Irene Reitzman to visit her parents, and from there they'll hop to Cuba, and I'll bet a cookie it will turn into a honeymoon trip. The other night I asked our most distinguished actress this question. When should an actress retire? When she dies, Hedda. <laughs> Ethel Barrymore. <laughs> yes, you asked me a lot of other questions with perfectly obvious answers. But, Hedda, I've been interviewed so many times. That... Oh, I didn't want an interview, Ethel. Oh, I know. Here in your column, you like people to argue with you. People with complaints, people with access to grind. Well, yes, I like to share my column of soapbox. No, I don't like soapboxes. I have no problems. I know that surprises and problems are what make news, but I haven't any. Isn't it sad? <laughs> 
I love Hollywood, and I love making pictures. I know. You've just finished two of your best, Kind Lady for Metro and The Secret of Convict Lake at 20th Century Fox. Yes, I'm all settled down in a lovely house. But wait a minute. That's my point, too. No news is good news. The item I want from you, Ethel, is something that expresses just that. Everyone's desire for contentment, peace, and a place to settle down in. It's a poem you read to me once called An Old Woman of the Roads. Oh, yes. I know. I love it. It's by that Irish poet, Pedrick Collum. Here it is, Hedda. Oh, to have a little house, to own the hearth and stool and all, the heaped-up sods upon the fire, the pile of turf against the wall, to have a clock with weights and chains and pendulums swinging up and down, a dresser filled with shining delf, speckled in white and blue and brown. I could be busy all the day, clearing and sweeping hearth and floor, and fixing on their shelf again my white and blue and speckled store. I could be quiet there at night beside the fire and by myself, sure of a bed and loath to leave the ticking clock and the shining delf. Ah, but I'm weary of mist and dark and rows where there's never a house nor bush. And tired I am of bog and road and the crying wind and the lonesome hush. And I am praying to God on high and I'm praying him night and day for a little house, a house of my own, out of the winds and the rain's way. Thank you, Ethel Barrymore, for honoring us today. Jeff Chandler will surprise his friends by showing up at the Academy Awards with his estranged wife. Jeff's up for an Oscar, and they planned this evening long before there was a cloud on their domestic sky. I hear the reason Prince Trubeskoy is asking such a large settlement from Barbara Hutton is that he has to pay Freddie McAvoy 10%. Freddie is supposed to have arranged the match. Last week, John Charles Thomas said that all our native musical talent needs is a chance. Well, one of the finest proofs of that is a young man who's never studied or even been to Europe, who got his start singing on NBC. Yet today, he's one of the Metropolitan Opera's brightest stars. Yes, he's Robert Merrill, and makes Hollywood news this week by starting to work on his very first movie. It's for Paramount, and it's got quite a handle. Aaron Slick from Punkin Creek. With Dinah Shore, Alan Young, and you as a slippery character from the big town with Lawsony in your heart. And a yen for Dinah. Hedda, let me tell you about some of the romantic songs Diner and I... Robert, I hope you'll sing some operatic numbers. And I have some of the choicest laugh lines. <laughs> Listen to this one. You know, you sing opera so beautifully. And if you want to hear some of the romantic moments in which I... After all, so few people can really do justice to opera. Um, yes, ma'am. <laughs>
accetto vi dissi ora ascoltate come gli ascolto andiamo incominciate That was so beautiful, and I have no doubt that Robert Merrill, movie star, will make my column many, many times. But this, after all, was about Robert Merrill of the Metropolitan Opera. Evelyn Keyes, touring South America with Pat Neal and June Haver, left them to return to Rio, where she's romancing a millionaire. When her maid heard this story, she said, impossible, Miss Keyes never did go for a man who's got any money. <laughs> Carmen Miranda cracked this one. Tallulah Bankhead should have no trouble whatever getting money. All she has to do is to dip into her lower register. <laughs> Doris Illimore's bringing her son Ridgely home from the hospital tomorrow. He's gaining back a pound a day. He lost 16 during his illness. You know, a few weeks ago, Hollywood was thrilled over the return of one of its finest actresses. Yes, in a local production of Maxwell Anderson's Joan of Lorraine, the star, Louise Reiner. Twice winner of an Academy Award as Best Actress, Louise has been absent much too long. And on Easter Sunday, I can think of no more fitting item for my column than the return of Louise in another story of sublime faith, the story of a miracle, the song of Bernadette. It's a story of suffering and the story of a vision. It opens in a convent where Sister Marie Bernard lies dying. Dressed in white with a blue garter and a golden rose on each foot. How is she feeling today, sister? She's in great agony, Mother Superior. Sister Bernard. Oh. Bernadette. Bernadette. It's been so long since I've been called that. Are the pains worse, my dear? They, they're not so bad. But there must be something I can do for you, sister. Anyone you would like me to call. No. Yes. 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 I would like you to ask the Dean of Lourdes to come. The Dean of Lourdes? He will understand. He will come. He will understand. Now. He didn't understand when I was a young girl. No one understood. When I was a young girl. Your Reverence, she was dressed in white with a blue girdle and a golden rose on each foot. I saw her. I did. Do your parents believe this story of yours? I don't think they do. If your lady were real, wouldn't other people see her too? I don't see why they can't. She's there. She speaks to me. And what does she say? I saw her again today. That's why I came to you, Your Reverence. The lady said, please go to the priest and tell them that a chapel is to be built here. Let processions come hither. Chapel, processions. Do you think tomorrow would be soon enough for your lady? Oh, yes. I'm sure she'd be delighted. And now that I've given you the message, I'll... I'll... Well, I've all the... Oh, one moment, one moment. Come back here. I have an idea. I want you to tell the lady this. That the Dean of Lourdes would like a little miracle. <laughs> yes. I think that will take care of it. A miracle. Uh, anything yet? Bernadette, see anything? Nothing yet, Bernadette. She just stands there and prays. Uh, nothing will happen. From the time we were this high, they tell us the Blessed Virgin is... Look! 
Look at her, Bernadette. She's walking towards the grotto. Oh. To the spring. What did you say? To the spring. She talking to. There's nobody there. Here. To the spring. Well, there's no spring there. Just dry earth. Just dust. She's scratching at the ground like an animal. <laughs> she's crazy. I told you she's crazy. Oh, come, Bernadette. Come away from here, child. Nothing will happen to this. But the lady has told me to. Look. Look. Water. It came from out of nowhere. Out of the dust. There's a trickle of water. She told me. Bernadette, what are you doing? My eyes, get away from me. I'm bathing them. My eyes. Oh, ah, I can see. When I do, I see. I'm blind. You know that. But look, I can see. Bernadette, the Bishop's Commission admits the... Uh, possibility that you were chosen by the powers above, and that your hand alone brought forth the spring responsible for uh, miraculous cures. Well, if they should find these things to be true, then the greatest and wisest men of the church will be watching you for decades. Oh, well, that's terrible. It can't be. I don't want it. Uh, it's no small matter, but you must face it. Bernadette, did you imagine yourself as part of the church someday? As a nun. As a nun? Oh, Lord, no. That's far above me. I just want to go back and, and work for Madame Millet as a housemaid. Please. No, no, my dear child. If to you the most blessed virgin condescended, then you cannot suddenly play truant and run away from your destiny as though it were school and become an old widow's servant. No. No, maybe not. If heaven really chose you, I am afraid there's nothing left for you but to choose heaven. Isn't that true? Yes. I guess so. Yes. That's right. Of course, if... If you admitted even now any doubt about the lady, then there might be somewhere in this world a little corner where you could hide and lead a normal life. You mean to live on a beautiful farm with my own geese to take care of? And someday be married and have children and... Or to suffer perhaps the rest of your life because of people's doubts. Would you like a little time to think it over, Bernadette? I don't need time, Your Reverend. Because I've never lied to you. I don't want my little corner... To hide him. To those who believe in God, no explanation of certain things is necessary. For those who don't, no explanation will suffice. I believe in God, Benedict. I won't question you anymore. I, for one, believe you. <laughs> Thinking fast, Your Reverence. I got here as fast as I could, Mother Superior. Your Reverence, we've tried to make her go back to Lord herself. Should not she, of all people, take advantage of the benefit that has come to the whole world through her? But I've told you, it cannot be done. And why not? The miracle, the healing spring. It's not for me. But certainly, Bernadette, of all the people in the world... Long ago, you told me that I must suffer. I've been sick. And all these years, people have pointed at me and doubted me. But if any of this real suffering... When I was a child, when I saw the lady, she told me, I cannot promise you happiness in this world. Only in the next. You understand, don't you? Of all people. Of course, I understand. 
I understood the moment you chose your path. But it's all so long ago. I still look for the lady. But she's never here. When my pain comes, I look for her and... Your faith is strong, my child. She's gone. She's gone. Where are you? Where are you? I was asleep, but my heart won't. She's gone. It is the voice She's of my gone. beloved. I feel But not that saying, open unto me, my sister. I love my dove, my undefined. My lady, I can see her. You, you did come. I love you. that the Blessed Marie Bernard Subiru is a saint. We enroll her name in the calendar of saints. We decree that her memory be annually celebrated in the name of the Virgin on the 16th of April, the day of her heavenly birth. Easter's here again, and I'd like to tell about the Easter I remember best, the last one I spent with my mother. She came to California the last time for her 85th birthday, and for Easter, instead of a cathedral church or a sunrise service, we chose to go to Yakaloma. On the night before and on Easter morning, watch the great Mojave Desert unfold its brilliance under the rays of the rising sun. We rose early and went out upon the desert, which at midday is a barren waste, but which at sunrise has such majestic brilliance as no human hand could ever duplicate. With the Joshua trees standing guard, suddenly, as if ushered in by a heavenly choir, an overwhelming panorama of beauty burst upon us. The rising sun kissed the carpet of wildflowers, and the desert woke in all its glory. It was a symphony of nature, God's handiwork. My mother gazed a while and said, This is lovely, but I miss my church back home. I replied, Mother, look about you. These desert flowers, blended as only nature can, the Joshua trees, the fragrance, the pastel sky. To me, it's much more beautiful than any church or cathedral built by human hands. She was silent and then softly said, I never thought of it like that before. And down on her knees she went and prayed to her God and mine and yours. Next week, NBC will again bring you Hedda Hopper with Hollywood News brought to life by Agnes Moorhead 
a surprise discussion with MGM's executive producer, Dory Sherry, and the one and only Danny Kaye. Good night, everybody. This program is transcribed. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Theater Guild on the Air presents next Douglas Fairbanks in A Tale of Two Cities. Also this evening on NBC, Joel McRae stars in the exciting Tales of the Texas Rangers. Now hear A Tale of Two Cities. It's Theater Guild on NBC.